Dr. Watson, you and Mrs. Watson have been a blessing and a benediction in my life. You had a great part in my call to the ministry. I remember that night out in front of the old building where the 18th green at the Temple Terrace golf course was. The moon was shining under those palm trees and that heavy moss. And tears were coursing down my cheeks as I knew God was calling me to preach, but I didn't want to preach. And finally, I remember I knelt down and I was all alone. And I said, oh God, I'll be what you want me to be and I'll go where you want me to go. Amen. And that was the changing of my life. I remember the first sermon that I ever preached. John Mender took me. I don't know what had happened to the past. I think they'd run him off. It is a little Baptist church in Bostick, Florida. And it was a cold night. And they had one of those big round stoves in the middle of the church. And it was way out in the country. And 36 people were there. And I had prepared eight sermons. And uh, I thought I could last at least an hour with each one of them. I preached all eight of them in less than five minutes. <laughs> but during these years, since in 75 years, there are certain things that have not changed. And I want to read a passage. Yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken, as of those things that are made. And those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. We are living in a shaking and crumbling world. Three weeks ago, the London Daily Telegraph had as its lead article and headline, West on the Verge of Collapse. We are decaying from the inside. The Italians, the French, and the British are in serious condition tonight. Lebanon is in chaos. Southern Africa stands on the very threshold of a bloodbath. The Soviet military power grows by the hour. Americans, are busy with a high standard of living the world has ever known. Watching television, sporting events, apathetic, so much so that only 30 and 40 percent of the people are even going to the polls to vote. So that whoever is elected president is going to be elected by a minority. And we stand on the very brink of what could be disaster unless we wake up and wake up fast Amen. we don't have much time God says I'm going to shake the world once more and things are going to be destroyed judgment is going to come but some things will remain through these 75 years of the life and ministry of W.T. Watson, some things remain that'll never be shaken. And the first one is the nature of God has not changed and will never change. God said, I am the Lord, I change not, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He is unchanging in his holiness, unchanging in his judgment, unchanging in his love. The hymn writer wrote, change and decay and all around I see. O oh, thou changest not, abide with me. God doesn't change. And it's very interesting in all these years and the changing theological, sociological, political tides of the years that I've been preaching, I have not had to change one iota of the gospel I learned Amen. at the Florida Bible Institute. Amen. Secondly, the word of God has not changed. 
the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to write a book on the subject, How to Face Persecution. Because we as believers throughout the world, and in many parts of the world they're facing persecution, the likes of which have not been faced since the Middle Ages. My wife is a great student of China. She was born and reared there, and she toured recently along the edges of China, gathering all the information she could about what's happening. And I'm not at liberty to tell you some of the things that we learned. But I can tell you this, in many parts of the world, Christians at this moment are suffering for their faith. But the word of God has not changed. And one of the things we need to do is to hide it in our hearts. Corey Ten Boom will tell you. Many of those people that have gone through prison experiences will tell you that the thing that sustains them in those prisons is the Word of God. You students that are here tonight, memorize it, study it. The greatest regret I have tonight is that I didn't memorize more scripture when my mind was keen and able to memorize. As you get older, it gets more difficult. It takes me three times as long to memorize a scripture verse now as it did when I was your age. Memorize all you can. And then the third thing, human nature has not changed. When I go around the world, whether it's in Africa or Latin America or Asia or Europe, and I'll be in Europe in three weeks preaching in Germany and Scotland. When I go to any of those places, I know that the human heart is the same. There's the same emptiness, the same longing, the same desire, something to believe in, something to give myself to. And I also know that human nature produces lust and hate and greed and causes ultimately war. And Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart hasn't changed. Look at your newspapers and television. Every day we watch the television and we shake our heads. My wife and I are alone now. Our children are gone. Five of them and 11 grandchildren scattered somewhere and one child we're responsible for. He's still in high school, but he goes to New York to school. And we watch the television and uh, my wife uh, takes out a little paper every night and she watches John Chancellor or Walter Cronkite and she'll put down all the crisis they have in that half hour program. It'll average about 14 crises. You try it sometimes. But in this world of crisis, these things have not changed. The moral law has not changed. And unless we as Americans in this bicentennial year get back to the moral law expressed in the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount, we are in trouble. Is it too late for America to be saved? Is it too late on our 200th birthday to be saved? No, it's not too late. It looked late for Nineveh. And Nineveh repented in sackcloth and ashes, and that was the greatest evangelistic campaign in the history of the world when Jonah preached in Nineveh. And everybody was converted from the king on down, and Nineveh was spared. And if we could start at the White House and come to your house and my house, in humility and repentance of our sins and call upon God, it's not too late. Amen. And we could have a mighty, sweeping, spiritual awakening. I see evidences of it everywhere. It's showing up in the election campaign, I believe. Prayer groups and Bible study groups everywhere, all over America, are springing up. God is moving among his people. Amen. And perhaps he's getting us ready for the persecution I was talking about. And then fifthly, the hope of heaven has not changed. We look for a city whose builder and maker is God. Here we have no continuing city. Dr. Watson is 75. The average age of the American male that re today, when he dies, is 68. You are now seven years beyond that. But Dr. Watson, The gospel that you preached, and I remember the first sermon I ever heard you preach, 
Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The way of salvation is not changed. You see, God gave to Dr. Watson the heart of an evangelist as well as the heart of an educator. And he, he tried to put the two together. And it succeeded. He didn't build a great institution. He built an institution so that all the faculty could know all the students and all the students could know each other. And I believe today that that's what we need. Our institutions have gotten too large. I serve on several large institutional boards. And I felt for a long time, I go to many, in fact, most of our crusades today are held on university campuses. We're going next year to Notre Dame University for a crusade. We're going, our next crusade is uh, at, uh, in Seattle, which starts next week. That great new stadium that they have there. And we work among the students and we get the students to come. And I feel so sorry for students that go to universities where they have 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 and 60,000 students because they feel so lonely and they feel so lost in the midst of all that. They can't get close to faculty. And some of the faculty they want to get close to, not worth getting close to. But Dr. Watson has kept a dedicated, consecrated faculty here and a student body that I believe has been chosen of God, and I meet them everywhere. Several people that serve on my team are graduates of this institution. And I'm proud of Trinity College, and I'm proud of the associations that I had here nearly 40 years ago. And I thank God for everything that I learned in the classrooms, but primarily from the lives of these men. Yes, I learned to preach there. But tonight, I say to you, my dear friends, congratulations to these two warriors of the cross. It won't be long till we'll all be in heaven. We'll all be reunited. And we'll all have a thousand years to talk it over. We're, we don't have long to live our lives, and we don't have long to work. But we're going to have eternity to talk Amen. about. Amen. And we're going to have eternity to celebrate about. And what a day that's going to be when we're there singing in that great chorus, glory to the blood of the Lamb Amen. in heaven, the new Jerusalem. What a tremendous hope we have. We are a colony, a minority of people in the world those of us that believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But in that day, we're going to be there saved by the blood of the Lamb, by the grace of God, to serve Him for eternity. And Dr. Watson, there's going to be a many a person there because you were faithful in the task God gave you to do. Congratulations and God bless you.